Now recall, the washer method is something you use when you have two functions. We we'll call them f and g, two different functions, and they're both revolved around the x-axis like that. And because we have two functions, we're really interested in the volume of the shape carved out between those two functions. So you should have a hollow center. We've talked about that before. That's why we call it washer method. And what you're doing is you're going down and integrating along the length of this object, looking at the cross-sectional area, which all looks like you know, little washers. So, so far, all of the problems that we have done have had this sort of a curve up here and a curve here, and we're just kind of looking at in, in between A and B uh, along to try to find the volume of the object. In this section, we're going to give you two functions. We're going to apply exactly the same methods that we've done before. There's nothing different. The only real difference in the problem type is that here, F and G, the two functions we're interested in, they're going to intersect. So they're going to crisscross, and so they're going to form an enclosed region. And we're going to revolve that enclosed region about the x-axis. And what we're trying to do is find the volume of that enclosed region. So a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, that's basically what we're doing. Let's go ahead and start the first problem, and you'll see very quickly what I'm talking about and why we need to go ahead and use the washer method to, to pull it off. So on a test or an exam or a quiz, what you might see is basically a problem that gives you two functions. So I'm going to call the first one uh, y is equal to 1 half x squared plus 3, or it could be labeled f of x. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, and we'll give a second one, just like we've always been doing. Uh, in this case, it'll be 12 minus 1 half x squared. And on your problem, it might say, you know, typically what we were doing before is we'd give two functions and we'd say, find the volume of the enclosed region between these two graphs, uh, between a and b. That's what we've been doing before. In this section, I'm going to go ahead and let you know, and the problem will usually let you know, hey, these two graphs here, if you were to plot them, they actually cross. So they're not parallel. They actually cross at some point. So what we're trying to do is, whatever that enclosed region is, that between these two guys where, they, where they're enclosed, in that, in that enclosed region, we want to revolve that entire enclosed region about the x-axis and find the volume of the resulting shape that, that pops up. So notice I didn't tell you that we're integrating between A and B. And that's because when you're trying to find the volume of an enclosed region like that, then you need to figure out where they cross. You need to figure out where these two graphs intersect, and those are the limits of the integration because that's the boundaries and the limit of the enclosed region between these two guys. So it's, it's much simpler if we just do it. Let's figure out, assuming that these two things cross, how do we figure out where they cross? What values they cross at? Well, if they truly do cross, then we must be able to set them equal to each other and figure out where they cross. So we'll set them equal to each other, and we'll say something like 1 half x squared plus 3 must be equal to 12 minus 1 half x squared. Basically, what we're saying is the y values, if these things really do crisscross somewhere, the y values must be equal of these two graphs somewhere if they cross. So now that we've got this constraint going, let's go ahead and solve it. So we'll take this 1 half x squared, and it's a negative, so we'll move it over here. That'll make it positive. So when we add these together, we'll have x squared on the left. And then we'll take this 3 and we'll move it to the right-hand side. So we'll subtract 3. 12 minus 3 is 9. All right? And so you can see that we just move the x squared over here, we move the 3 over here, and we get this. And it's very easy to solve for x. x is plus or minus the square root of 9, which would be 3. So what we have figured out is that when x is equal to positive 3, and also when x is equal to negative 3, these two graphs cross. Because we know they cross because we've set the y values equal to each other, and these are the corresponding x values that go along when the y values you know, are actually equal. That means they must be crossing at a certain point if the y values are equal. And these are the values of x that that occurs. So, you know, all of you guys working in calculus have graphing calculators too, and it's, it's worth your time once you figure this out to, to pull your graphing calculator out and also just quickly see what this graph might actually look like. So what we're going to do is, is that right now. So if here's an xy plane, so we'll call this x, we'll call this y, um, what you would find if you actually graph this is you find one parabola that would kind of come like this, right? And this one here is going to be equal to uh, y is 1 half x squared plus 3, 
1 half x squared plus 3. Had to run out of space there, so I just put it like that. So that's the this one right here. All right, and then you'll also have another one. I'm going to change colors. And the other one is going to kind of start from the bottom, and it's like a frowny face, and it's going to go like this. And this one is going to be y is equal to 12 minus 1 half x squared. So the frowny face is 12 minus 1 half x squared. So you can see that they actually crisscross, and if you look and see where they cross, this would be at x is equal to 3, and this would be at x is equal to negative 3. And that's exactly what we found here. Those are the spots where they cross. So you see that it makes an enclosed region here, right? This is the region that we care about. The problem statement says graph number one and graph number two, they form an enclosed region. We're going to then revolve this enclosed region about the x-axis and we want to find the volume of the resulting three-dimensional shape. So this little, you know, fish-shaped object or whatever you want to call it, football-shaped object, we're going to take the whole entire thing, we're going to revolve the whole enchilada about the x-axis so you can kind of imagine this ring that forms, or this donut that forms, but the cross-section, you know, when you kind of look at it this way, it looks like, like a football or a fish or something like that. So it's, it's a little bit weird. But we know that if we're going to use the washer method, it's totally fine to use the washer method just as we've done before. The fact that they cross don't real, doesn't really matter at all. If we want to find the volume here, we start integrating from negative 3. We integrate over to where they stop intersecting again to positive 3. That's going to get the, the boundary uh, in this dimension here. And then what we're doing is we're using the washer method. We're taking basically um, at every single slice, we're looking at the cross-sectional area of the top curve coming down and we're looking at the cross-sectional area of the bottom curve coming down, and we're basically subtracting the two so that what we're getting is the area between them. And when I say the area, I mean the cross-sectional area at every point we integrate, and we're going to add all that stuff up. So we're doing exactly what we did before with the washer method. All of those explanations apply perfectly. It's just that we just needed to figure out where they cross first so that we can get the limits of integration ourselves. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve this problem by saying we have integration from negative 3 to positive 3 of the following. It'll be pi, open a bracket, 1 half x squared plus 3, and I'll put a parentheses around here, that's squared, minus, and then we have this one, 12 minus 1 half x squared, and that's object is squared, and then it's dx. Okay, make sure you understand what's going on here. Basically, if you kind of distribute the pi in, you have pi f of x squared minus pi f of x squared over here. Now notice, now notice what we're doing here. This pi times this function squared is giving us the cross-sectional area of a slice of one of these functions. And then this is giving us the cross-sectional area, pi f of x squared for the other function, is giving us the cross-sectional area, if you slice it and kind of look on the end, of the other function. Because they're, they're both circular, when you revolve them around the x-axis, you're, you're getting circles. So it's like pi r squared. We've talked about this before. So we're getting the cross-sectional area of each function, and then we're just subtracting them to figure out what the cross-sectional area is of a slice right, between the two functions. That's what we're doing. Same thing we did before. But I want to point something out to you that we'll kind of get to when we get to our final answer. When we look at our graph, we see that the blue function is the one that's on the top, and the red function is really the one that's on the bottom in the, in the region that we care about. So really, when we construct this integral, if we were smart, what we would do is we would have the top function listed first in the integral, and then we would have the bottom function listed second in the integral. Because when we do the subtraction here, we really want to have the larger number, the larger area that we're cat, the larger cross-sectional area minus the smaller cross-sectional area. But if you notice, because I put this one first, I actually kind of have it backwards. I have the bottom function uh, listed first, and I have the other function, the top function, listed se secondly. Now, in truth, when I first worked this problem, I didn't really pay attention to what the graph looked like, and I just kind of you know, did it exactly the way I'm going to work it for you here. And if you think back, I told you what would happen if you actually got the order backwards. I told you the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a negative, um, a negative answer, a negative volume. Now, you all know that negative volume is impossible. So I'm just trying to do this as sort of like a, a learning exercise for you. Let's go ahead and work it this way just to show you that you know, the numbers are going to come out totally fine. 
but the actual answer is going to be negative. So if you actually do that, then you just go back and realize, oh, well my, my top function that I had on top, really, I had it backwards in my integral, and so the math is all correct. You're just gonna get a negative answer. So it's perfectly fine to do the, do the thing this way. It's just that when you circle your finer answer, you probably should just say it's positive volume. All right. So how do we do this? It looks a little bit ugly. We've got squaring going on, and we have you know, these binomials in here everywhere. There really is no way to do this other than to bust it out and do it. In other words, you know, students sometimes look for shortcuts. You can't look for shortcuts here. You just have to do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to work on all of the squaring business here. Okay. So let's work on this. We have this guy squared. So what we're going to have when you take this first term squared, 1 half x squared squared, what you're going to get is 1 fourth x to the fourth. And then you have to have plus 2 times 1 half x squared times 3. That's the middle terms. And then you have plus 9. What I'm doing is I'm basically expanding in foil this guy. But you know the, the shortcut way, it's not really a shortcut, but the way to, to do that easily without actually doing F-O-I-L is the first term squared, last term squared. The middle term is 2 times the first term times the second term. And that should be something you remember from algebra. Okay, So that is this giant thing. And then just to kind of keep it clear, in um, purple, I'm going to work on the second one. So we have 12 squared, which is 144. Here's a minus, so we carry a minus through. 2 times the first term times the second term, 1 half x squared, like this. And then the last term, since it's negative, it's squared though, we're going to get plus 1 fourth x to the fourth, like this. All right. So we've done everything correctly. This minus sign comes because we've, we've got a minus sign between the two guys that we're squaring. This guy is just this guy squared. This guy is just this guy squared. So let's go ahead and just kind of bang through it and see if we can simplify. So what we're going to have here in blue is 1 fourth x to the fourth power. This 1 half times 2 just disappears. So you're just going to get um, 3x squared plus 9. And then for now, let's just kind of keep everything in, in its own brackets. Uh, just, just for the next step, just to make sure. So inside here, what we have is 144. And then over here, we'll have minus uh, 2 times 1 half just disappear. So we have 12x squared. And then we have 1 fourth x to the fourth power. OK? So now that we've done it all, all of this stuff boils down to what's in here. Now that we've done it all, we can easily just remove these parentheses and make this a plus and make this a minus like this, and we can remove this parentheses because that's not really needed anymore. So all we did is distribute this negative in, making it negative 144, making this a positive, and making this guy a negative down there. All right, so is there anything else we can do? Well, we have 1 fourth x to the fourth, canceling with negative 1 fourth x to the fourth. I'm scanning around, I don't see anything we can actually cancel, but I do see some terms that we can combine. We have 3x squared, we have 12x squared, that's gonna be 15x squared, right? And then I have minus 144 and I have plus 9. So if you do this guy right here, you'll have a negative 135. So what we have figured out is that when you take this guy and square it, and you take this guy and you square it, and you subtract them, and you simplify all the algebra, you get something very, very simple in the, at the end of the day. So really what we need to do, uh, because don't forget, the whole point of this is we're doing an integration, right? is we're doing an integral from negative 3 to up to positive 3 of pi times what we just found. So let's move over to the next board over here and actually do that. So we have an integral negative 3 up to positive 3 of pi times what we just found here. And what I'm going to do is take pi and bring it outside the integral just to make it a little bit easier. And on the inside of the integral we have 15x squared minus 135 dx. And that is exactly what we have. We were integrating negative 3 to 3 pi times this quantity. We just found what that quantity was over dx. So the problem really reduces to, to solving this integral, which is not a very complicated integral to solve. OK, so what do we get? Let's take the pi out here. And we'll just go ahead and figure this out. 15 over exponent plus 1, exponent plus 1. So that's pretty simple. We have a minus sign. This is going to be 135x. The integration is now complete. We go from negative 3 to positive 3. So all we have to do is now evaluate the upper limit of integration minus the lower limit of integration. 
and then basically the whole thing's finished. So what we're going to have is we will have pi out here, and let's go ahead and open up a bracket and a parentheses, and this 15 divided by three will be five, of course. So we'll have five x to the third power, so we'll evaluate at the top limit, three to the third power of minus 135 to the third power. So that'll be basically evaluating our answer at the top limit of integration. We'll subtract off evaluating it at the bottom limit. So this will be five. And then what we'll have is negative three to the third power from here. And then we'll subtract off 135 times negative three. And then we'll have a big parentheses and then we'll close the whole bracket off like that. So it looks a little bit ugly, but you know what? It's just math at this point. So we'll have pi, we'll open this up. And what we're going to have, this guy, when you multiply 3 cubed and multiply by 5, you'll get 135 minus 135 times 3 will be 405. And then this guy is very similar. You have a negative sign here. So the only thing that's different is you have negative 135. And then over here you have a positive 405. All right. So there you go. When you do all this stuff, 135 minus 405 and get that answer, and you take negative 135 plus 405 and get that answer, and you take these two quantities and subtract them in the order that we have them, what you're going to get is negative 540 pi. All right, so the answer for the volume of this object is 540 times pi, but we get a negative answer. So if you weren't kind of aware of what we're talking about, if you weren't aware of, of what, what we were talking about with regard to, to the setup of the two graphs that we have, then you might look at something like that and get worried. You might say, well, why is it negative? Did I do something wrong? But you need to realize that whenever you get negative answers, unless you've made a math error somewhere, it's very likely just basically going back to how you have your integral set up. Because again, the top graph here, when we're doing a subtraction, we're literally taking the top um, cross-sectional area minus the bottom cross-sectional area, right? If we have reversed it, what we've basically done here is we're taking the bottom cross-sectional area, the bottom, the red curve, and subtracting off the top cross-sectional area, which is the top curve. So every slice we look at, we're getting a negative difference here, and then we're adding the whole thing up as we go across so we get a negative answer. But the math is the same. If we actually were to take these and flip them around the proper way, top curve minus bottom curve, then think about it for a second. All of this stuff would be all the same. All of the expansions would be the same. It's just there. Everything would be reversed. All of the simplifications here would, would you know, be uh, basically backwards from what they are now. And so whenever you get down to the end, you'll have different signs in lots of different places. And so you'll get the same number, but you'll get a positive answer. And so that's really important for you to remember. Um, if I were you and I did this on a test and I got this as an answer, I probably wouldn't just circle that as an answer. I probably would, I probably would uh, put a note down here and say the volume is 540 pi. And then I would say in my integration, I had F and G, you know, backwards, but the math is the same. I'd probably put a note like that just to make sure that everybody knows, hey, I know you can't have negative volume of an object, right? Okay, so that is an example of how you do the uh, washer method when you have two functions revolved around the x-axis and they intersect forming a closed region. So you can use this washer method for enclosed objects was what the point of this really is. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.